Well, thank you, Richard. Uh, I, I, he talks about my preaching. I will say this. I, I am intimidated to preach behind Dr. Cliff. Dr. Cliff is, <laughs> yes, Dr. Cliff has uh, been my mentor for many, many years. Uh, taught me in seminary. In fact, taught me everything I know about yes. preaching. And uh, I used to, when Dr. Cliff was in evangelism, I used to call him up and go over to his house and jump in the car with him, travel all around while he preached, and I went and listened to him preach and just soak it all up. But he is a dear friend. I appreciate him asking uh, me to come and uh, share with you out of God's Word this morning. Uh, as a church, you do continue to pray for Miss Becky. I know that's heavy on their hearts and their minds, so you pray for Miss Becky and pray for Dr. Cliff as well. If you have your Bibles this morning, it's Christmas time, so let's turn to the familiar chapter in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, I want to speak on this subject this morning. Wise men do not miss Christmas. You know, it's amazing to believe that anyone could miss the real meaning of Christmas. And it's really amazing to believe that someone could miss Christmas where, where there's so much advertisement. And yet much of the advertisement today is really not about Christmas. And so it is possible for us to miss Christmas. Could you imagine living 65 to 70 years and dying and spending eternity separated away from God, having lived through 65 Christmas seasons with all of the advertisement, all that's said, all that's done, and yet still miss Christmas? And folks, for 25 years, I thought the Christmas season was a time of party. I was born and raised in a Catholic home, didn't know anything about the Bible other than what the priest told us, and so Christmas time for me was all about partying. I mean, it's party time. It, it, it's Christmas. So I saw Christmas as, as a time of celebration, but then I met the Christ of Christmas on April the 17th, 1979. When I met my wife, I had never been to a Baptist church in my life, and I wanted to date her, and she said, if you want to date me, you have to come to church with me. And that was a smart thing to do. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, and as soon as I got under the preaching of the Word of God, I was saved on April the 17th, 1979. And because I was born and raised in a Catholic home, I, I had an insatiable desire to get into God's Word and to study it and to read it. And so for 45 plus years now, I've been studying God's Word and teaching it and, and preaching it, and, and Christmas has been uh, different ever since. Well, I want to just deal this morning with three particular people, actually two people in one group, that all literally miss Christmas. And we have a record of it in the Bible. And so I'm telling you this morning where you have an opportunity, if you've missed Christmas for forever how many years you've been alive, I want to tell you this morning, you can meet the Christ of Christmas and you can know the real meaning of Christmas. But I'm going to talk about some people this morning that are already gone, they're out in eternity, and, and all of them miss Christmas. So let's begin in Luke chapter, chap, verse 1 of chapter 2, and let me read the first seven verses. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger. Now watch this, because there was no room for them in the inn. No room. Those shameful words describe more than an inn in Bethlehem. And folks, I'm of the personal conviction this morning that they apply to today's world just as they did in the first century. And so sadly, in all of the busyness of our Christmas celebration, most people still make no room for Jesus. 
e even without realizing it, they miss Christmas. They're just like most of the people in and around Bethlehem on the night that Jesus Christ was born. Folks, did you know that most people miss Christmas every year? And now that sounds rather silly, especially here in God Bless America, where during the holidays we drown in a sea of, of all kinds of Christmas advertisement. I mean, they observe the season because culture says that's the thing to do. But the masses are utterly oblivious to the reality of what they're really celebrating. So much of the fantasy and the myth have been imposed on the holiday called Christmas that people are absolutely numb to the real miracle of Christ's birth. And folks, one thing hasn't changed since the time of Joseph and Mary. Nearly everyone missed Christmas that first Christmas too. So like people today, they were busy, consumed with all kinds of things, some important, some not so important, but nearly everyone missed Christmas. So the similarities between the world over 2,000 years ago and the one that you and I are living in today are absolutely striking. So I want, to note a few, I want you to note a few with me this morning. Number one, I want you to note with me that the innkeeper missed Christmas because he was industrious. The Bible says in verse 7, it simply says, there was no room for them in the end. And folks, that statement must be one of the saddest in all of the Bible. No room in the end. Somewhere in history, there was an innkeeper who did not find it in his heart or in his end to make room for Jesus. Folks, he missed the opportunity to be a part of the most miraculous and the most important birth in history. Can you imagine the Son of God would have been born on his property? But he had already placed up a sign that we see oftentimes, not only in the world, but we also see it in our churches that says, listen folks, it says it's on our hearts, no vacancy. And what you're really saying is, hey, you can talk about Jesus and it's all right for you, but I want to tell you something, friend. My heart's already crowded. I've got all I can handle. It's all I want in life. And I have no room for the Christ of Christmas. Jesus could have been born on his property. And you see, folks, the innkeeper, he was so industrious. He was so business-minded. He was so preoccupied that he missed Christmas. Now, in Luke chapter 2, in the verses that I just read, it teaches us that it was census time in Bethlehem, the time of registering. It was a time of taxes. And so the city would have been bulging with everyone whose ancestry went back to that little town. So the town was crowded. The innkeeper was busy. Now, there's no indication here that he was hostile, no indication that he was even unsympathetic. And you know, people will say to me all the time, you know, preacher, I don't go to church and I'm not a Christian, but don't get me wrong, I don't have anything against either one. And you see, people like that, they're not hostile. They're not unsympathetic. They're just basically saying, hey, preacher, I'm preoccupied, but thanks anyway. And folks, they place a no vacancy sign on their hearts. It's amazing if you turn on your TV and and you watch the news and the business channel, and, and here's what you're hearing about Christmas. Well, sales are up. That, that's what Christmas is all about. We're going to have a better Christmas at Amazon this year. And, and by the way, Amazon is making money because with the COVID, they're putting all the small businesses out of business. So sales are up. We're going to have a better Christmas. Amazon sales are up. Walmart sales are up. So I want to ask you folks, is that a good Christmas? Sales being up? Can I ask you a very candid question this morning? What if people go to hell? Is that a good Christmas? Is it better to get the message out of the real meaning of Christmas or to get sales up? So all of the advertisement, it just saturates our minds. And you see, exactly like millions of people a day, it was that way in the first century. Their souls were consumed with activity. And it wasn't necessarily sinful activity. It was just all of those things that kept them busy. So at Christmas, 
People are especially busy. They're shopping, they're at parties, there are concerts to go through, and all of these things compete for our attention. And so in all of the clutter of activity, many preoccupied people miss the Son of God, the Christ of Christmas. And I don't believe I'm blowing this out of proportion this morning when I say that our world is filled with millions of innkeepers. And if that were not the case, there would not be so many grim faces in our stores today. And there wouldn't be so many exhausted people in our churches just a week here before Christmas. And friend, I want to tell you something. I, I love parties. I mean, my spiritual gift is hanging out. But, but listen, Christmas parties is not what Christmas is about. I love celebrations. I love singing. I like to be a part of the festivities, but I want to tell you folks, that is not Christmas. Christmas is Jesus Christ. And listen, the gift that is most important is not the one under the tree. It's the one God placed on the tree. So the innkeeper, he missed Christmas. He was industrious. There's no, nothing wrong with being industrious. But when you're industrious to the point that you're too busy for Jesus Christ, listen to these words, folks. You are too busy. Man says, well, preacher, I appreciate you inviting me to church. I don't have anything against the Lord. That person, see, he's never been hostile. He's never been unsympathetic. But he says this, I don't have time to come to church. I mean, you know, preacher, I work five days a week. And then Saturday, I've got all these things to do around the house. And Sunday Sunday is, is the only day I have off. And you know what he's saying? He's, what he's saying is this, I, I am an innkeeper. And I am too busy for Jesus. Well, let me tell you something, folks. You may be too busy, but God hear the appeal from this pulpit this morning. Don't ever, don't ever find yourself too busy for Jesus. So the innkeeper, he missed Christmas. Well, let's look at another person. Who else missed Christmas that, son, that Christmas? Well, Herod the king, he missed Christmas. He missed Christmas because... Not because he was industrious. He missed Christmas because he was insecure. Over in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 8, the Bible says, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. Now, now I'm going to take for granted that you know the story, but let me just kind of fill in the blanks this morning. See, folks, when Herod heard that there was going to be a king born, he said, you go find the king because I want to worship him. But let me tell you about Herod this morning. He wasn't telling the truth, folks. He wanted to find this king so he could do away with him. See, he didn't want any competition for his throne. And if you know anything about Herod, and I'm going to talk a little bit out of history now, but, but listen, Herod was a scoundrel. There was nothing likable about King Herod. He was guilty of murders, including at least one of his wives. He killed at least three of his sons. But, but Herod, he is pretending to want to worship Jesus. He, see, he was fearful of this one who was called the king of the Jews, and he was fearful because of his competitiveness. His paranoia was legendary. In one of the final acts of his wicked life, he's very old now. He knows he has just a very short time to live. And as a result of knowing that his deathbed was drawing nigh, he had the most distinguished citizens of Jerusalem put in prison. And he commanded that they be slaughtered at the moment he died. And let me give you a quote by Herod. Some of the last words recorded in history of King Herod. Here are his words. Herod said, I know the people will not weep when I die. Well, I want them weeping even if they have to weep over someone else. Can you imagine what a wicked guy? And so he actually put people in prison to have them slaughtered and put to death the moment he dies so that the city would weep even if it's not over him. All that's recorded in history. And, and folks, you see, the Herods are fearful of having to be submissive and having to answer to someone else other than themselves. And I want to tell you, the Herods of our world or like those in Luke chapter 19, verse 14, when they said, we'll not have this man, speaking of Jesus, we'll not have this man to reign 
over us. So what we have today, folks, we have a world of self-appointed kings who will not bow down to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so we're afraid that if we come to Jesus Christ, we're going to have to give something up. And friend, let me tell you something. You won't give up anything compared to what you'll get. And may I remind you this Christmas season that the blessed Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, needs nothing that we've got. But we need everything that He has. And so we need to turn this thing around and get it in proper perspective. That it, see, it's what He wants to do for you and, and who He is and what He wants to be in your heart and in your life. So if you're like Herod this morning, even in a small way, perhaps you should pay attention to Jesus and you should hear these words where Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And of course the answer to that is absolutely nothing. Folks, if you lose the, in this world and you don't trust Christ in this world, you'll also lose in the world to come. So, so the Herods are not about to let Jesus Christ have his rightful throne in their hearts. See, folks, listen. Herods don't want Jesus interfering with their power. They don't want him interfering with their plans, their prestige, or, or their position. And yet the Bible says what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know how that translates? Seek ye first the rule of God in your heart. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these other things will be added to you. You know where you find that verse? You find it over in the context of Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, where Jesus said, Are you worried about what you're going to wear? Jesus said, I clothe the lilies of the field. Are you worried about what you're going to eat? Who do you think feeds the sparrows? Are you worried about your own life? Do you not know that a little bird never falls from the air? That I'm not aware of it? He even goes on to say, you think I don't know you? He said, I've even numbered all the hairs on your head. So Herod said, you know, I just don't know that I can allow the God of this universe who manifested himself in Jesus Christ, the one who was born out there in the feeding trough in Bethlehem, and Bethlehem is a word that translates house of bread, and over in John chapter 8, Jesus said, he is the bread of God that's come down from heaven, and anyone that will eat of him shall never die. And he offers himself freely to us today, folks. Unconditional love. And yet we've said in America, what we've said is, oh, wait a minute, back off. I'm going to let him see real, see real quickly that, that there's a no vacancy sign on my heart. Listen, folks. Every person that will go to hell, every person that will go to hell will have on their heart inscribed these words, no vacancy. And then when they turn around, you'll see on their back, it'll read, I will have no man to rule over me. And I'm telling you, my friend, Jesus Christ did come to save you and to be your Savior. But I want to tell you something else. He's not only your Savior, He is your Lord. And you don't come to Him saying, well, you know, hands off. I'd like to have an escape policy, a little insurance, but I don't want anybody ruling over my heart. And listen, folks, if that's your attitude, you don't have a clue what it is to know Jesus. And if that's your attitude, you've been hoodwinked. You've never been saved. Remember the Apostle Paul? When Paul got saved, what a radical conversion. Over in Acts chapter 9, when Saul of Tarsus was saved and became Paul, and the reason he changed his name, the word Paul translates small. Paul used to think he was a big shot until he got shot down by the Holy Spirit on the road to Damascus. And God really changed his life. And when God changed Saul of Tarsus, listen, ladies, I want, to, I want to say this about your husband. Men, I want to say this about your wife and your children. When Jesus Christ really becomes Lord and Savior of their life, they won't struggle anymore about what they're going to do with God and what they've got time to do with God. Their attitude is going to be just like Saul of Tarsus. When he said these words, Lord, what would you have me to do? See, folks, that becomes the attitude of a person that has genuinely surrendered their life to the Lordship of Christ. And, and that you're literally saying, I, 
I remove the no vacancy sign and I will have him to rule over my life. And I will submit my life to, to King Jesus to have authority over my life, over my family, over my position, over my prestige, over my power, over my possessions. I surrender it all to Jesus Christ. Well, Herod missed Christmas. The innkeeper was industrious. He didn't have time. He was just too busy. Not angry, not ugly. He, he just didn't have time for Jesus. And then there's King Herod. He was insecure. He thought Jesus was after his throne. And he, he was, but he was after the throne of his heart. And let me just be real honest with you this morning, folks. You may not like what I say, but I tell you one thing. I'm telling you the truth. Let, let me tell you what Jesus wants. Folks, Jesus does insist that if he's going to come into your life, he wants the throne. He wants the throne. You know what we've come to church for this morning? We, we've come to worship him. You know why? He's the only king here. He's the only king here. And then let me tell you the third group, and I'm through. Let, let me talk about the religious leaders. The religious leadership, they missed Christmas because they were indifferent. Over in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 4, this is, let me read verse 3. It's actually Herod who's going to speak this. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. So what did he do? He, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Now, folks, if you want to know where Jesus is going to be born, all you have to do is call the religious leaders. They know where he's going to be born. Remember, they had memorized the Bible, the Old Testament, while well, they had at that time. They had memorized the Bible. The religious leaders, they knew. And so when he went to the religious leaders, he said, where is Jesus Christ going to be born? And listen to what they said. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet, in you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. My goodness. So where is he going to be born? Here's Herod speaking out. Micah chapter 5, memory verse. Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. Now listen, folks. Isn't it a tragedy that some people will know where he will be born physically and yet never allow him to be born spiritually in their heart? Folks, why is it that we're more caught up in history than we are spirituality? Why is it that we'd rather know about Him than to know Him personally? See, a whole group of people miss Christmas. And they're all mentioned in this passage that I just read. They were the religious leaders, the chief priests and the scribes. And they knew exactly where Jesus was to be born. I mean, they were the theologians. They, they were the minds. They were the brains. They were the religious elite of Israel. They knew the scriptures well. The prophets prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, and yet they missed Christmas. <clears throat> These men knew where Jesus was going to be born. In fact, these Jewish people had been looking for the Messiah. But, but listen, they never even bothered to walk a few miles to see the Christ. Only about four or five miles to Bethlehem. They didn't even bother to walk to the city where he was born. And you say this morning, my, what a tragedy, Pastor. Well, how about all the people who live within a stone's throw of the refuge here? See? Do you know, folks, there are countless millions of people that are alive today that would stand here in a different language if they had a translator, and they'd give you the exact same testimony that I have. That They would tell you how they were lost in desperation and how God revealed to them that Jesus Christ was the answer, and, and they were gloriously changed. Millions will give that testimony. And I want to tell you this morning, people, they are begging in foreign countries to hear about Christ. But here on the fertile soil of America. There are tens of thousands. There are literally millions. That would not give a half a hallelujah. To walk a block. 
to hear the story of the cross. So before you and I get too critical of these religious leaders that would not get out in their sandals and walk those dusty roads for five miles to see the birth of the Son of God. He's not only been born in Bethlehem, but he lived a sinless life. He died on Calvary's cross. He got up from the dead, and yet still people will not come. Why did the religious people miss Christmas? They were indifferent. Listen, folks. They didn't care. They didn't care. At least Herod feared Jesus' authority. You understand, folks, he believed Jesus was born. Give him credit. He feared the king of kings. How about the innkeeper? Let's be gentle on him. He, he was just ignorant. He didn't know. He didn't know he had a chance for a miraculous birth to take place in one of the rooms in his inn. But the religious leaders, oh, they had all the facts. They knew, listen, they knew who he was. They were expecting him to come. And when he came, they didn't care. They didn't care. Now, folks, that's America. That's America. I guarantee you this morning, if this building here would seat 50,000 people, and I could bring 50,000 people into the refuge and tell the story of Jesus and say, if you've never heard that story, stand to your feet. I bet there wouldn't be five in the crowd that'd say, oh, I hadn't heard it. But listen, if God would sh were to show their heart, and if it would be possible for it to be a glowing color in the dark, and we could shine the spotlight of the Holy Spirit of God on their hearts, and sh you know what? It, and we were to say, God, there, there are some no vacancy signs. Shine the light of God on their hearts. Show us the no vacancy signs. I guarantee you in that 50,000 people, and I'm not exaggerating, I guarantee you at least 45,000 would have a sign out front saying no vacancy. The Messiah is just really not that important. But preacher, wait a minute. I got shopping to do. I'm just halfway through with my list. The only thing I can thank God for today is that the shopping centers are going to be open Christmas Eve. Preacher, understand I've got parties to go to. Families expecting me to cook. I can't let them down. By the way, preacher, what is Christmas after all? See, we know all the facts, folks. But we're just indifferent. Let me read a poem and I'm through. We sing that song, What Child Is This? Well, here's the poem. Some say Jesus was a good teacher, but good teachers don't claim to be God. Some say Jesus was merely a good example, but good examples don't mingle with prostitutes and sinners. Some say Jesus was a madman, but madmen don't speak the way he spoke. Some say Jesus was a crazed fanatic, but crazed fanatics don't draw little children to themselves and attract men of the intelligence of the, the Apostle Paul and Dr. Luke the physician to be his followers. Some say Jesus was a religious phony, but religious phonies don't rise from the dead. Some say Jesus was a phantom, but phantoms can't give their flesh and blood to be crucified. Some say Jesus was only a myth, but myths don't set the calendar of history. Jesus has been called the ideal man, an example of love, the highest model of religion, the foremost pattern of virtue, the greatest of all men, the finest teacher who ever lived. And while all of these descriptions capture elements of his character, they all fall short of the full truth. And I close with Thomas's expression that expressed it perfectly when he said to Jesus after the resurrection, remember, Thomas the doubter, Thomas said, unless I see the prince in his hand and in his side, I will not believe. And Jesus walked right through that wall, which is the way we're going to have when we have our glorified bodies, able to walk through that wall. And he said, Thomas, touch the prince in my hand. Remember, Thomas fell on his knees and said, my Lord and my God. Folks, he must be your Lord and your God. And so this Christmas, nothing would be better than for your life to become a Bethlehem and you invite Jesus Christ into your heart 
in life. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for, for wise men that they don't miss Christmas. And Father, even though I missed Christmas for 25 years, I thank you that I met the Christ of Christmas and received the gift of eternal life through him. With our heads bowed and eyes are closed, in just a moment this service will be over. Invitation hymn will be sung and everything will be history about this service. But listen, here's the invitation. This Christmas season, if you've never by faith opened your heart and made room for Jesus Christ on the throne of your heart and said, God, I need you to take control of my life, would you just say, God, I, I want you to come and take the throne of my heart. And God, I want you to rule my life. God, I don't want to be too busy for you. I don't want to be indifferent toward you. And Father, I don't want to be so insecure. I just want you to take control. And my friend, if that's the desire of your heart and you want Jesus Christ to forgive you and cleanse you and save you, then I'm going to pray this prayer and I want you to just pray it in your heart and ask Him to come into your life. You just pray this prayer. Pray it to God and mean it with all your heart. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin and save me. Father, thank you for dying for me. And Father, help me to live the remaining days of my life for you. Thank you for hearing my prayer this morning and for saving me. And now help me, Jesus, to never be ashamed for inviting you into my life. In Jesus' name I ask that. And my friend, if you made that decision and you're not ashamed of it, and if you did, you won't be ashamed of it, then in a moment when we stand and sing this hymn of invocation, you just come down and publicly profess Christ as your Lord and Savior. What a great time to do that here at the Christmas season. Father, in the name of Jesus, draw people to yourself now. Move mightily in our invitation. May it all bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, thank you all for being here this morning. Dr. Cliff used to kill me. I'd, he'd be going to preach a revival and I'd get in the car with him and I'd say, uh, Dr. Cliff, what are you preaching on tonight? He'd say, I don't know. I don't know yet. He'd kill me when he said that. I have to study for weeks to preach a message. I don't know yet. I'm not sure what I'm going to preach on tonight. Kill me. Thank you all for being here. Look forward to tonight. Y'all come back.